So let's review the marine environment now, the shallow marine environment, and let's talk about the type of diagenetic transformation we can have there and what the pump is for these transformations. So in shallow basin, we can have current circulation that leads to diagenetic transformation. But in shallow water settings, especially around the reef, we have a lot of wave action, which is a pump for fluid. So the water rock ratio is high because wave action moves water through the reef. And that leads to extensive cementation. So here's an example from New Mexico. Here I'm showing you the reef. So that's actually the, the uh, sediment that was deposited. This is actually infilling here in green by phylloidal algae. So it's an algae that grows in a cavity. So you can see that a lot of that big cavity was lost to phylloidal algae. But then here we have botryoidal cement. We had water circulation thanks to wave action that basically promoted the precipitation of a cement. And most of that cavity is lost to cementation. And finally, during the low stand, we have clastic that are being deposited in whatever is left of that uh, porosity. So we lose most of the porosity in the reef thanks to that water circulation. If we look at the uh, beach deposit, so that can be right behind the reef or at the beachfront, and again, that can be in clastic or in carbonate sand. There we also have high wave action, which also lead to extensive cementation. This is an example here of an oidal belt, and you can see it's extensively cemented. And finally, if we look at a quiet environment of deposition like the lagoon, Surprisingly, perhaps we can also have cements and cementation forming uh, in these environments. In particular, we can have hard ground forming. Why? Well, it's because we have low sedimentation in those areas, so the water rock ratio is high. A hard ground can, is essentially a lithified seafloor, and to determine that you're dealing with a hard ground, you need to find different evidence for it. For instance, you can have boring of the hard ground, which indicates that this was a hard surface at the time that these organisms lived there and bored through that surface. You can have class of cemented limestone, so that were, that were plucked from that surface. You can have evidence of encrustation of an organism that encrusted that surface, again, because it's a hard surface. Or you can also have expansion, expansion ridges, which show that cement was growing at that location and that forced the, the, the expansion of the sediment through that expansion uh, process. And finally, iron, manganese, or phosphate impregnation of the surface gives it a dark color. And this happens because there is not a lot of these, mineral, uh, these um, species, iron, manganese, and phosphate, in seawater. But with a lot of time of exposure, you basically can form a crust of these minerals. Another important process that happens in the marine environment is dolomitization. So what is dolomitization? So dolomite is a magnesium calcium uh, carbonate. So you have one calcium, one magnesium ion, and two carbonate ion. So this particular mineral is essentially mostly resulting from the transformation of calcite into dolomite. So that's known as dolomitization. And dolomites are important because if you look at the proportion of dolomite, about half of the sediments are carbonates, the other half are clastics, and dolomite form half of the limestone or half of the, the carbonate. So really dolomites are quite abundant. The problem is we don't fully understand how dolomites are being created at low temperature because we don't understand the kinetics of dolomitization. But what we do understand is what fluids lead to dolomitization, and we do understand some of the geological processes that lead to dolomitization. So let's have a look at that. So the first fluid that can lead to dolomitization is simply seawater. There is magnesium in seawater, so you can potentially create dolomite. The other fluid that can lead to dolomitization is hypersaline waters, because hypersaline waters, we will see, concentrate magnesium. So concentrated magnesium means dolomitization is relatively easy in hypersaline conditions. 
Now subsurface or hydrothermal fluids also tend to be saline, so that means that you can have dolomitization, plus actually the temperature is usually high, which favors dolomitization. How about meteoric water? Well, meteoric water are chemically dilute, so that means that you don't have a lot of magnesium, and by extension, dolomitization is not possible in meteoric water. That's one of the exceptions. So in the marine realm, there are multiple ways that you can create dolomitization. Again, we know now, or you should know now, that a pump for fluid is what is needed. You need to circulate a lot of seawater, marine seawater, to lead to dolomitization. So what are the potential pump for dolomitization in the marine environment. The first potential pump is known as a geothermal convection mechanism. Imagine that you have an isolated platform surrounded by cold water. This cold water will tend to enter the flank of the platform. But once they get into the platform, the geothermal heat will warm those waters. And once they become heated, they become more buoyant, so they tend to rise up and then essentially create a cell, a geothermal convection cell, that leads to circulation of vast amounts of seawater and over geological time, dolomitization. The other potential model of um, dolomitization in the marine realm is during low stand deposits, what happens is you create a freshwater lens. Now that freshwater lens essentially put a hydrostatic pressure on the water below, and that leads to circulation of a mixed seawater, freshwater lens, and that circulation entrains also the circulation below in the platform. And that seawater circulation can lead to dolomitization, and in fact, this mechanism is thought to be what's active today in the Bahamas.